Um, thank you, uh, the organization, for inviting me again. It's one of those moments, Brian called me up and said, dude, we want you back. And we need you to speak. I'm like, okay, cool. What, what do you want to talk about? And he's like, come up with something new. <sighs> Damn him. You know how hard it is to come up with new talks? It's, it's like really hard. Um, so I, I looked into, um, you know, the stuff I was doing currently, um, where my life was and all of these situations. Um, and I wanted to explore something different. So that's where this talk came from. And there's, there's a lot of story behind it. Uh, very special people that need to be uh, introduced. So this is a talk that is really going to go away from the usual technical stuff. Um, so I hope it reaches out to everyone, whether you're a coder, designer, marketing guy, whatever you're doing. Um, I, I hope this reaches out to you. So I hope, it's, I hope it works. I hope you guys like it. It was made precisely for this event. So it is the first time everyone's going to see it, including myself. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how it works. <laughs> Uh, so that's the disclaimer. Um, I am not a doctor. I am not a neurosurgeon. As you can see, I don't have nearly enough money to be a neurosurgeon. Um, so this is all about observation, right? This is all about my experiences. Um, so, you know, take it easy on the facts. Maybe something might be weird. Uh, if anyone here doesn't know me, uh, my name is Rafael Doms. Um, I'm a self-labeled community guy. I basically run around creating user groups. I work mostly with uh, vanilla PHP, as they call it. Um, I don't have that much experience in Joomla, but I really love the Joomla community, as many of you can tell by me being there all the time. Uh, so I'm really, really, really glad to be here with you guys again. So that's me. That's who I am. But for this talk, I need you to know someone else. Uh, and this is my wife, Chisilla. Some of you may know her. She's usually around the event. She's sitting in the back right there trying to hide herself. Um, and, you know, it's the whole cheesy uh, Hollywood story. This is, this is the girl who made me believe in the Disney fairy tales, right? She is the love of my life, and I have no problems in admitting that. Thank you. So, like any uh, Hollywood movie, uh, there needs to be drama, right? And, and that did happen. Uh, two years ago, my wife suffered an accident. Uh, she was in the hospital for a very long time, uh, and she had brain trauma um, with the accident. So this was a very hard time for both of us. Uh, you know, her in recovery and me trying to support her and all that happened. Um, and I hope I don't choke up. Okay. Um, so so my, my, my mother always said, you know, if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, right? So that's what I did. And we tried to draw from, um, from this experience. It was a very tragic experience for us. But we tried to draw from that what we could learn, right? And in trying to come up with a new talk and trying to figure out how to communicate with this crowd, uh, I was trying to figure out how can I use all of these lessons uh, with development, with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it ties into another story from another friend. Um, does anyone here know ProTalk? No? ProTalk is a website where we put up videos. Uh, most of the Joomla videos from last time are there as well. Um, it's just an aggregator of code-related videos and, and audio, right? Uh, and I work on that uh, with a few good friends. Uh, one of them is Kim. And Kim one day reached out to me and she asked me, how did you learn to be, you know, to think like a developer? Well, that's a very hard question if you stop to think about it. I was like, well, you know, it's... Uh, how many of you would say, if, if you are, uh, you know, have been in, in development for a long time, and someone asks you, how do you do it? How do you figure out what solutions you can reach out to and how you can solve problems? How many of you would say it's gut instinct? You kind of get this feeling. Yeah, I kind of get that feeling. I, I know this code is better than that one because I just, I just feel it, right? That's kind of like what we feel every day. That's if, if you ask most of the senior developers around, they're going to tell you that. It's like, oh, it's just a gut feeling. I just, I just know. I just know this code is better. There's not that much, oh, well, this code is better because of this aspect, that aspect. You just get this. You look at the code and you say, eh, this is no good, right? And so I thought about that. I was like, yeah, gut feeling. And I felt, you know what, that's, that's not an answer. That's, that's me dodging a question. So I stopped to think about it, and I stopped trying, trying to figure out what, what, what is it? You know, what, what's about developers? What do developers do on a day-to-day -day basis? Not just developers, everyone else. And, and, and big spoiler here, it's, it's not about code. This is actually about solving problems. 
that's what we do. Developers solve problems. People from marketing solve problems. People in design, people out in the streets. Humans, we solve problems. That's what we do every day. The difference between developers and everyone else is that we solve problems with code. Right? That's our tool. That's the tool we use. The same way doctors use their medical devices, we use code. That's the tool we use to solve problems. But that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Someone comes up with a problem, we offer them a solution. We use whatever we have to create a solution that's going to make their life easier, or it's going to make their life different, or whatever it is. Right? And being a developer is taking those, those tools and doing the best you can. I mean, there used to be a time where being a developer meant you would go out to um, a bookstore, you would get one of these, and, and then you would become a developer because you would take this uh, little sheet that came with it, you would type all of that into the computer, right? this little black console, and it would work. And you're like, oh, I'm a developer. No, you just typed code. right? So yeah, this is aging me. This is totally telling me where, how old I am in this industry. Uh, but this is not what being a developer is. It's not just typing code. It's not repeating what someone else already did. Being a developer is all about coming up with new ideas. It's all about using that tool to the best of that situation um, that you're solving. So when we think about solving problems, which is our daily, daily bread, um, I like to be, well, from what I see, from what I observe, there's a three-step process involved in it. The first step of solving a problem is understanding the problem. And understanding the problem is basically where you're trying to delimit all of the boundaries of that problem, the rules that apply to it, all of the, all, everything that surrounds that problem. Can I use this solution? Can I not use this solution? What are the, 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 what's the data that's coming in and what do I expect as data coming out? Right? That's understanding the problem. Once you figure that out, the next step is you need to figure out how to solve that problem, how to implement that solution. And that's figuring out the pieces that you have, how those pieces fit, which pieces fit, which don't, and putting that together to create a solution. That's the second step. I'm terribly sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, he was shocked about the solution. It's crazy. Uh, and then the third step, after you have implemented that solution, is you need to evaluate your solution. Because a solution is no good if it does not solve the original problem, if it violates the rules, if it violates that scope that you had defined. So the final step in solving a problem is evaluating that solution that you came up with and seeing if it actually fits. OK, so those three steps, let's go through them. Um, and I want to dive into them and kind of bring in uh, my wife's story and everything we learned uh, with these. So understanding problems, right? Understanding problems is the first step. You can't solve a problem if you have no idea what that problem is. Um, so a few of these theories can help you understand problems better. The first thing that you must do is, as you're going to try and understand a problem is to have a plan. You need to have a plan of how you're going to approach that problem. So. We fail miserably at this most of the time. You know, we just go out crazy doing stuff. Uh, but having a plan is going to give you the structure of, of you know, how to evaluate things. It's going gonna, it's gonna to guide all of those three steps. So story time. Um, during my wife's therapy, uh, we were with the psychologist. And, and during this period in her recovery, uh, what happens when the brain suffers trauma is it kind of shuts down a whole bunch of different areas and focuses on the ones that it needs to, to use at the moment, right? So what you see is you see all of the primitive processes that your brain has. You see them like really up close um, during that process. So she had lots of therapy on, on training, like retraining the, the, the brain to do things so it would reactivate these things once she was stable. So one of these days, we come into the office, and a psychologist puts a puzzle in front of her. Uh, and I'm not kidding, this is the actual puzzle. It's a 50-piece Disney fairy princesses puzzle. You should have seen her face when she saw that puzzle. She was like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> you want me to solve a 50-piece puzzle? Ah, that's easy, right? Anyone can do it. And the doctor is all serious, you know, like psychologists are, and he's looking at her and he's like, yeah, but this is to show you some of your cognitive processes. She's like, okay, whatever. So he says, okay, I need you to solve this puzzle. 
So what she does is she, um, she starts doing it on impulse. She starts solving the problem because that's what happens, right? She picks it up and she starts putting pieces together, trying to piece, well, this looks like this, this looks like that. And what she ends up with is a whole bunch of little clumps, a little clump here, a little clump there, right? You can see because you're just trying, you know, recognize these things and put them together and you're doing that. And that's great. With a 50 piece puzzle, you can solve the problem with that. Because after a while, when you're making these clumps of pieces that look like each other, these clumps start coming together, and after three or four clumps, you know, it's not a big puzzle. Now, can you imagine doing the same thing with a puzzle with, I don't know, 1,000 pieces, 3,000 pieces? Is that strategy going to work? It's not, right? You're going to have a little clump here, all of these blue puzzle pieces here, and then this other clump here, and they're never going to come together. The amount of effort you're going to have to put in all these different pieces to make them really come together at the end is going to be huge. And that's, that's exactly it. I mean, if you have a small enough problem, sure, you can just go at it and, and you know, start coding away, and it works. However, if you have a big enough problem, you need structure. Right? What she did is she was simply doing that based on impulse. Because the brain is based on instinct. We talked about gut instinct. That's what the brain does. The brain has all of these instincts inside that tell us how to do things. However, what the brain does on top of that, and that's what we use on a day-to-day -day basis, is we use actual cognitive processes to stop us from doing our impulses and thinking, planning ahead, knowing what we're going to do. Doing that recovery, this is exactly the kind of stuff that was turned off. So she would just do it on impulse. Yeah, just start doing it. How many of you do think that that sounds a little bit like you coding? You know, you just pick it up, you start coding. Oh, I know this little piece. Oh, and I need a logger here. Oh, now I need a function here, a button there. You just go all over the place, right? We, we start going without structure. We have no idea what we're doing. We just know that all of these pieces at one point are going to come together and we're going to have solve the problem. Does that sound familiar? It does, right? That's, that's, that's the first thing you learn as a developer. Just, just start doing something and then the rest will come to you. But you need to have a little bit more structure. So what the doctor said is, okay, let's try that again, but let's try that with a plan. Let's start with the corners. Let's make the little border around it. Then we follow this little princess here, then we follow that one. You kind of give structure to it. You know where you're going. And what he also did, he, was brought, he brought in um, the picture the picture of the puzzle, that overview that comes in the box. Look, this is what you're aiming for, you know, aiming towards. How do you get there? How do you implement these things, right? So he brought that and obviously, well, she had already gotten the puzzle on the first try, she got the puzzle on the second try, uh, even faster, because she had strategy, she had a plan. It was a little bit harder to suppress that instinct of just going and, you know, actually doing this and not stopping to focus on all of these little pieces. But that's the same thing with code. If we have an idea, if we keep that overview in our heads, those pieces of code are no longer isolated pieces of code. They have a role to play. And if you know the role that that piece of code plays, you can write um, code that's a lot more uh, performant and does exactly what it needs to do. So bringing in that plan is really important. If you're doing development, be sure to bring in a plan, have an idea, and, and not lose the overview. Keep track of that big problem you're solving. Don't focus too much on the little pieces. Cool. So, one other theory. Ah, sorry about that, my throat is catching again. Um, one other thing that you can use while you're solving problems is empathy. Right? Empathy is, is the art of understanding someone else's feeling, right? kind of putting yourself in their shoes. Okay, that's all about feelings and that's great. How does that play into development? That, that plays a lot into development. Because when you're solving problems, you have clients, right? We all know clients. Like I said last time, clients are those things put in the world to change their minds every day. Those are clients. Um, but you need to connect to your clients when you're trying to develop and solve their problems. Because what happens most usually is that the, the clients don't come to you with problems. They come to you with solutions. How many of you have heard this from your client? Right? I need a button right here. Right there. I don't care. Just need a button right there. 
That is not a problem. That is a solution. Now, that's fine. It could work 90% of the cases. I don't know. That's fine. However, you know as a developer that that button is the tip of the iceberg, and there's this much code behind it to do whatever that button does. Right? So the client knows his domain very well. He knows his problem. He knows exactly what he needs. However, you know the code very well. You know the technical aspect of all of this very well. And what you need to do, and this is where empathy comes in, is you need to, you, you need to connect to the client on a level that the client is able to explain to you his values. What does he actually need? Why does he need to get this information? Why is that information important for him? And once you get that information, then you can compare that with your technical aspects that you know and figure out where does this fit in my platform. Is it good as a button? Good, implement a button. But maybe it's different. Maybe it's better if I implement this as a toggle on this other side of the part of the web page or something like that. Right? So what you're doing is you're bringing together the technical aspects that you know that you're good at, and you're bringing in those feelings from the client, the, the values, what the client really wants, what the problem the client is trying to solve really is. Right? So empathy will really help you with that connecting to the client and making sure you're solving the problems that really need solving. Uh, there's one more strategy. Um, it just, it's technically called restating the problem. But what it actually means is uh, putting the problem in your own words. We do that every day. As someone explains something to you, you kind of repeat that with your words. Right? How many of you know the expression rubber ducking? No one? Rubber ducking. So rubber ducking is a, a very valid strategy where you pick up a rubber duck, you put it up in front of you, and you explain your current problem that you're trying to solve to the rubber duck. Magically, your problem will be solved. It has nothing to do with the rubber duck. Because as you're explaining to the duck, you are listening to that information on another level. You're processing subconsciously new information about the problem that you had not realized. Usually what happens is by the time you finish explaining that to the rubber duck, and people are looking at you because you kind of look crazy talking to a duck, fine, but you start realizing all of these different aspects of the problem you were not aware of on that first level. You start realizing, oh wait, of course I don't have to do this, I can go this way, I can implement a function here, or I can just do this with that class. Right? So rubber ducking and restating the problem is kind of like Imagine you're trying to climb a mountain. Restating the problem is the equivalent of going around the mountain trying to find an easier point. I mean, if you look at the mountain and you say, I'm going to climb that mountain, and you start going up, by the time you get up there, you look down, there's a stairs on the other side. That's no good, right? You want to you wanna be able to find these things before. So restating the problem gives you a chance to find these shortcuts, easier paths, uh, different solutions. It's just a technique. If you're doing PHP, I honestly um, recommend doing elephant plushing. It's a lot more fun than rubber ducking. They're great listeners. How many of you have elephants? Oh, guys, you need to fix that. More elephants. They're pretty cute. Anyway, they're really good problem solvers. So if you need solving problems, go talk to them. OK, so that's understanding the problem, right? So these are a few things of how we can understand problems better so that we can uh, you know, try to solve these problems along the way. But then we need to implement the solutions. So one of the things that separates experienced developers from regular developers, oh, it's like I'm going away. Uh, what separates experienced developers from, from beginning developers is the ability to come up with these crazy solutions, right? You, you look at the speakers, you look at the developer, and it's like, oh, I know. We can solve this by doing this, 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 and that. And you're like, where did you come up with that? How did you bring that idea into your head? How did you even think that was a possibility? Right? As a junior developer, that's what you think. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm no good at this. I would never have thought of that. But the difference there is that being a senior and an experience is not about time. It's about experience. Because what the brain is exceptionally good at on everyday basis, on everything we do, is the brain is amazing at recognizing patterns. Our whole structure of the brain 
is, is made so that we recognize patterns. We look at someone else's face, we recognize the patterns in that face, and we say, oh, yeah, that's Robert, right? That's what the brain does. The brain is really good at doing that. So one day, I was watching uh, binge walking, uh, binge watching uh, TED Talks, you know, like you do on Fridays. And I ran across one that was pretty interesting. Uh, it was a talk about brain plasticity. Now, plasticity is the way that your brain grows as, um, as you're learning, right? The way it changes physically, right? And he was describing two stages. Uh, one of them is the stage we're currently at, which is the stage where your brain changes its plasticity based on actual learning and, and, and new behavior acquired, right? You have to actively learn, practice, gather new skills, and then be able to use them. And then the brain will change um, its internal structure according to those lessons. But he also described the initial period, which is what they call the critical period. And this is where little babies just born, they do not understand language, right? I mean, you talk to a baby, it's cute, he smiles, but he has no idea what you're saying. Not at all. But what's happening there is the brain is setting up so it can become this learning machine down the road, right? And during this stage, you, you, it doesn't understand, the baby does not understand what you're saying, but the brain is becoming a master processor of the patterns of natural language. The sh, the ah, the, all of these little sounds that we make. He has no idea what they mean, he hasn't attached meaning to them, but he's gathering all of these patterns so that the brain can recognize them, put them together later down, la later down the, the, the road of learning, um, and actually you know, make that become knowledge. So the brain, from the very beginning, is all about pattern recognition. That is how the brain works. Right? And that's pretty cool. I mean, you, you look at, at, at these things. So that also explains why it's probably not a good idea to put your baby under a ceiling fan. You don't want him to become really good at ceiling fannies. You want him to learn natural language. This is also what happens, for example, uh, if children have hearing problems at that young age, um, it can also lead to problems like dyslexia because they're used to different patterns. Right? So I was really amazed at this talk, and it is really interesting how, how you know, little things can affect so much and, and how this amazing machine we have actually works. So the difference between a young developer starting up in his uh, developer life and an experienced one is all about experience. It's all about the amount of patterns that we have stashed in our head. Why do experienced developers know different crazy solutions to problems? Well, because they have seen those problems over and over and over again, and they have tied them up to different solutions. Because there's one big important thing here, which is this is a combination of stimuli and memory. If we had no memory, we would suck at coding because we would never remember what we did. We would do that learning process every single time. So when you join stimulation and you join memory, you get pattern recognition. You can go back, look at those patterns, and see, oh, well, this is how I solved this last time. Now I can try this again. And the way to do that is reading. Reading. There's lots of content out there. Have you ever rec recognized books like uh, Martin Fowler, the um, Design Patterns, Gang of Four, any of these? If you look at those books, they're pretty much set up like an encyclopedia, kind of like a catalog of different patterns. That's because as you understand the patterns and you practice them, you kind of get the idea of how to solve them. Um, so you don't need to know all of them, but you say, wait, hold on, I remember a pattern that looked like this. You go through the book, you find the pattern, you get the details. It's not important to really attach all of these details. The most important thing you need is to be able to find the path towards these solutions. Right? And that's, that's what the brain is good at, pattern recognition. Um, it's also about environments, right? So the same speaker, uh, he was talking about how the environment molds uh, our skill set. Uh, and he did a study, which was uh, quite interesting, in, in California where he, he, he lived. Um, he checked out the children around, he looked, went to talk to them, went to study, and he realized that about 15% of the children in that area of California could balance a soccer ball on their heads successfully, right, 15%. So he went and did the same study in Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
Well, if any of you are Brazilian, you probably know that um, everyone in Brazil is born with a soccer ball, right? Straight out, we born soccer ball. Kid, doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl, soccer ball is part of your learning. It's, it's part of that basic skill set. And as it turns out, 60% of kids in the same, same situation, 60% of them could balance a soccer ball on their heads. Because that's the environment. I mean, I remember as a kid, I suck at football. I'm sorry, I suck. But, you know, that's what we did every day. You know, you put a little two flip-flops over there, two flips over there, and you have a, you know, a whole field. And you're currently thinking you're Ronaldo and lots of, lots of fun. But the environment molds that. The environment promotes all of these skill sets that you have and kind of draws the lines, right? So this is why it's very important to work with people who are better than you. Right? Have you ever heard the expression, A players hire A players, B players hire C players? Right? We usually try to, th there's a lot of this happening, right? You, you try to hire people who are worse than you so you look better, right? Like, no, I'm, I'm better than that guy, I'm fine, I can hire him. I'm going to look good. But if you hire people who are smarter than you or are better than you in different areas that you're not, you're going to get challenged. And that challenge is going to get you to learn more to go further. So if you are between two jobs, one of them you're going to be the lead developer of a group of people, and the other one you're going to be this, you know, just a developer amongst the smartest minds in PHP community, go for that one. Doesn't matter what the money is, go for the other one because you're going to learn so much. I had the chance to work with people from uh, Doctrine, uh, PHP core developers, and the amount of stuff I learned from them just by, you know, contributing on a day-to-day -day basis with them is amazing. So always try to aim to work with people who you can learn from. That's really good. That environment is really going to um, focus you and, and give you new opportunities. So read lots of code, right? Um, Kayla, who's going to be talking tomorrow, she coined a term. I'm not sure if she coined it, but I heard it first from her, um, called GitHub Wondering, where you just open random GitHub repositories and go through them and try to understand what's going on. That's really good. I mean, look at all of these code that other people wrote and see how they solved the problem. How did they solve the same problems that you have? Look at their point of view. How did they, you know, change this? It might not be better or not than you, it doesn't matter. But you're trying to put more patterns in your head. The only way, like I said last time, the only way to recognize bad code is by seeing enough code that you can actually have an opinion on it. So read lots of code. But more importantly, just, just reading is not enough you need to create memories, so you need to practice that code. Practicing. That's where open source comes in. This is why projects like Joomla are so important to the community. It's not just about saving time for the next person who's going to do a website. This is a team learning experience. By contributing to open source, you're practicing all of these little things that you may not have had time before. But you're putting all of these different point of views, you're recognizing all of these new patterns that everyone else is doing, and you're, you're learning how to develop your own patterns. Right? So contributing to open source projects, doing side projects, whatever. Practice. Practice lots of it. Also expand to new languages. Not just new languages, new frameworks, new CMSs, whatever. Expand beyond your boundaries. It's all about gathering more patterns. Right? For example, PHP recently got uh, generators. How many of you know what generators are? Okay, and how many of you have experience with Python? So Python, right, the language? Uh, Python uses generators for every single uh, for loop. I might be butchering this, but that's how it does iteration. Now, as a PHP developer, we might not know what generators are, but as a Python developer, they are the essence of the language right there. Right? The only way to do certain things is with generators. If you already know that from Python, when that comes into PHP, boom, you already know it, right? Different point of views, different patterns that map out to the same solutions. So again, you're expanding that library that's in your head. And you don't need to know all of these things. And you, know, you, you don't actively know them. Your brain handles them. That's the beauty of it. It's just when you start thinking about them, your brain will find that crazy connection between lunch with your mother and, oh my god, this pattern, right? I, I don't know how it makes these connections, it's insane. 
but all of a sudden you pull up that memory and then you can go find the details of implementation or whatever it is. But having these bridges in place, that's where it's important. Um, how many of you remember object calisthenics from last year? All right. So object calisthenics, like I said that day, is all about recognizing the patterns. It's not about the rules or whatever, if your code is good or not. It's about recognizing these patterns that lead you to understand different aspects of your code. Right? However, um, there is one problem with um, pattern recognition, uh, and it's a thing called apophenia. And this is where we start looking at clouds and we start seeing you know, submarines, sharks, or whatever. That's our brain. It's so used to finding patterns that it starts looking for patterns everywhere. Right? You look at a, I don't know, a potato and all of a sudden you see the face of the 55th president of the United States. Right? That's your brain trying to find patterns. So you need to be careful with that um, also in development. Right? Because sometimes there's just no pattern there. Sometimes it, there are details which we tend to overlook because we look and say, oh, this is the perfect case to use solution A. Yes! And we fail to see the little differences that actually invalidate that scenario. Remember, understanding a problem is about the boundaries and the rules. So be sure to pay attention to them. Uh, you also need to avoid <laughs> the syndrome where when all you have is a hammer, well, sorry, when all, you have is a, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like nails, right? When you know something very well, for example, if you know Joomla very well, Everything can be solved with Joomla, right? And maybe that's not the case, right? I mean, I'm a PHP developer. Oh, sorry. No, I, I didn't mean Joomla. I meant something else. No. <laughs> now, I'm a PHP developer. That's what I do for my day-to-day -day work. You know, I've been doing this for, I don't know, too long. Um, and, you know, every time I, I try to solve a problem, oh, of course, I'm going to use PHP. Oh, I need to write a website? PHP. I need to do something on the command line? Ah, PHP. I need to write something for my VCR? Ah, PHP. That, that's not it, right? There are different places for different languages. Can you do something in common line with PHP? Yeah, you can. Is it good? Eh, not so much. If you want to do common line stuff, Python, amazing. Blows PHP away in the common line. But if you never expose yourself to all these things, you don't know that. Right? So it's really important to break out of the same patterns and always try to uh, try new things expand your knowledge, expand your comfort area, because then you have different tools to deal with the problems. You don't have to be an expert in any of these. Just make those bridges. Uh, another way to try and solve a problem uh, when you get stuck is starting with something you know. So a few months ago, I was trying to implement um, OAuth 2. Everyone familiar with OAuth 2? It's an authentication process when you're talking to APIs. Big fancy name very complicated in some points, right? I read through the documentation, and I was like, oh, I, no, I don't get it. I have no idea what this is, right? I couldn't see where it would fit. I had an application, I had an API. I couldn't put them together, right? Me, 15 years of experience, and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? Bashing on the keyboard. So I got stuck, and I tried to figure out how can I get past this? So what I did is I stopped. I looked at what I had. I looked at what the documentation was, and I realized, okay, well, I know that this part is supposed to look like it. And this, this case was implementing the actual communication of the API without the signatures and whatever. I'm like, I'm going to start with this, because I know what this is, right? So I started experimenting with that a little bit. I did a little proof of concept. Oh, it works, okay. So now that I have a little proof of concept, I need to make this thing authenticated. So I tried it with that, and it authenticated. Oh, awesome. So now I need to implement this website that's now going to communicate to this one. Oh, it works. Before I knew it, three days later, I had the complete implementation in all of these little proof of concept pieces. I now understood that whole scope. I was like, you know what? I know how to solve this problem now. So I went back, refactored the code because it was awful. Um, but you know, through that experimenting, I actually came up with the solution. because iteration is the name of the game. Um, this is one of the cognitive te tests that you still did. It's called the BADS test. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit complicated, but basically this thing is filled with water and you have to get this cork out with this little circle, the little metal stick, and the little plastic plate. It's a big comp It's not that hard, right? 
but it requires certain cognitive processes, which was where she was having trouble with. So the first time she tried to do this, she looked at the doctor and said, I don't know, I can't do this. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, I can't figure it out. We left that, we did more training, more patterns, more cognitive processes, a lot, lot more therapy. A couple of months later, she came back, she did half of the test, and I was like, okay, I can't figure out where to go from here. This, this little tube thing here, there's a little trick to it, it's actually open in the bottom, so as you close it, it's, it's leaking. So I was like, wow, how did they want her to solve this with that? That's crazy. Left it. A couple of months later, she did it again. And she did it in the first try, no problems at all. Iteration. First time she had an issue, she kept going, she kept going, she kept trying. Right? And that brought it to the final result. So iteration is really part of the game. and It's what we call in, in development refactoring. Refactoring is a very important part of developing anything, doing anything, even design, any of these areas, iterating is really good for you. Right? When I talked about writing perfect code with object calisthenics and all that, the first thing I told you, and I hope you all remember this, is that no one writes perfect code on their first try. No one. If you run your code the first time and it works, yeah, you should, something is wrong. <laughs> it just doesn't work. We don't do things right on the first time, and that's fine because we then iterate until we get to what we want. Usually what I do is I write code, keep iterating until it's, it works, so it goes from A to B exactly like I needed to do, but it looks horrible. It's a mess. Well, then I stop and I start refactoring all the little pieces into proper code, because now I know where I started, where I'm ending, how I got there, and I can make this process as good as it can be. So refactoring and iterating, really good parts of the process. Another thing is developing things in smaller pieces. That is what our brain does to solve problems. We break complex issues into smaller, less complex, numerous issues. And we solve each of these little problems on its own. I mean, if you, if you come up to a really big problem, it's daunting, right? You're like, oh, I have no idea how I'm going to solve this. However, if you break down that problem into oh, I need to do A, B, C, and D to achieve that, you start realizing, wait, I know how to solve A. Oh, I can solve C. And then things start coming together. So making smaller, simpler problems that you can solve faster is a really good thing. And this is where Composer really shines, right? You can pick out libraries from other people, put them in there, and you no longer have to solve the problem. Someone already solved it for you, right? Um, however, if you are beginning, if you're a beginner developer, Please, practice. There's a saying in the PHP community, uh, every PHP developer should write his own framework. Right? We take that very seriously. However, we forget the second part of that sentence, which is, and then throw it away. Right? The experience of developing a new framework is really good for all of these things I've been talking about. Learning new patterns, learning new points of view, understanding how to solve problems, understanding so the problems related to these problems. Right? If you never go through all these things, you will not know why certain frameworks do things in this way or that way. All of these decisions that shape the framework came from facing problems. Right? So as, as, as a young developer, you're starting off in a career, just try everything out. Don't share it later on and then tell people to use it. I mean, there are probably better libraries more established. But try it. Really get your hands dirty. You need to understand what's going on behind the curtain. This is what we do. We are the people behind the curtain, right? We need to figure out how these little pieces come together. OK, so that's implementing. Um, and then finally, we need to evaluate, right? Is this what we needed? We need to evaluate what it is. And the question that you're asking yourself there is, is the problem solved, right? And the way that you figure out if the problem is solved or not is by testing. That's what we do. Unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, uh, testing teams, QA teams, all of these, they're basically validating your problem. Here is your problem. Here are the rules. This is the solution. Does it solve it? These are your inputs. Are the outputs what you expected? Right? So you need to do a lot of this. Um, if you have automated testing, that's great. That's going to save you a lot of time as you're developing. It's going to save you a lot of time in the future. But also as a team, everyone needs to cooperate on 
a problem-solving level. That means everyone needs to solve problems, and other people need to evaluate if that problem was solved or not. Um, and as you're doing that, you might run into a problem where the problem is not solved. You may get to the end of, end of your sprint, and this is what happens. So what happens when your problem is not, fall, it's not solved? Well, that's a problem, right? And if it's a problem, we understand the problem, we implement solutions, and we evaluate. And we keep iterating, iterating, and iterating until that whole problem is solved, because all of these little problems have been solved. You see, patterns, repetition, iteration, refactoring, all of these things kind of come together. So the one thing I want you to take away from this is that being a good developer and all these things, all of these knowledge that everyone has that you look up to them and you say, oh my god, that guy is the best developer or that girl is the best developer ever, right? It's not instinct. This is learned behavior. You need to train your brain to do these things. No one is born a developer. It's not a gift. Oh no, I'm, I, I could never be a developer because I wasn't born with that gift of being a developer. No, 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 no. This is all learned. If you put your mind to it, if you put your heart into it, anyone can be a developer. And Well, designer, I have issues given my own personal experience. I'm not sure if you can really be a designer without being able to draw, which I can't. But I know as a developer, hey, you can do this. You can figure it out. It's all about learning the patterns and putting effort, practicing, really going out to it. But I think this, this qualifies for everything, quite seriously. I think this goes for anywhere. If you put enough of your heart into it, you will get there. So one more takeaway, try and tie back all the stories again. Um, so this was a really hard period, uh, both for me and especially for my wife. And one day, you know, this all of, all, of, all of this gets to you, right? You start looking to the future, um, and all you can see is the limitations that you have currently, right? All the problems that you're facing. Um, she woke up from the coma, uh, partially paralyzed on the right side. She couldn't communicate, right? So it's a very tough moment. And the doctor said something that really changed how we faced uh, that problem. He said, don't try to imagine the future, because you know, we couldn't see the future. Um, but focus on what you're doing now and let the future come together. Because if you're stuck in that moment right now and you're looking towards the future, all of the limitations, the problems you're facing now, you project them into the future. Right? So she would think, oh, I, I'm never going to... Like me looking at her and trying to figure out what's going to happen, I'm like, how are we going to do this? Our house has stairs. We're going to have to move. You're, you're projecting all of these things that haven't yet happened. Right? So focus on the now, because as you focus on the now, you put all your energy into new tools, new ideas, new ways of doing things. And slowly, what you realize is the future you are projecting is not the reality. So in development, when we start solving the problem, beginning of your agile process, for example, that is the moment where we have the least visibility, right? When someone asks you for something, you, you, you just have that information. As you start learning, understanding, and, and going through that problem and solving it, you start understanding more about that problem. The boundaries become clearer. The rules become clearer. So delay some of these decisions. If you make a bad decision at the beginning of a project, it's a lot worse than if you don't make a decision and you delay it until you actually have to do that. Right? You can't delay everything, otherwise you lose your plan. But the key details of that implementation can be left to the moment where you can actually do it. If you're a developer, don't worry about being the best developer ever in the world in 10 years, in 5 years. Don't focus on where you're going. Focus on being the best developer you can be every day. And it's fine. You know what being the best developer actually means? It means you're going to fail. It's OK to fail. We all scared of this world where we can't fail, right? Oh, if I do something wrong, my boss is going to scream at me. No, that's not it. Developers need to fail, because that's where we learn. By failing, we adjust, and we learn new things, and we solve that problem. What you can't do is you cannot repeat mistakes. 
Make every mistake once and then fix it. And focus on doing that every day. Focus on being what you can be on that day. How can you contribute to your team? How can you go beyond what you think you can do and try and make that day a victory? Do that. And that's what Jacilla did. She didn't focus on the problems. She didn't focus on the limitations. She didn't focus on anything that was making it difficult for her at that moment. She said, I'm going to get through this. This is with doctors telling her, well, you may never recover this, you may never recover that. She said, I don't care. I'm going to try this now. I'm going to put all the effort I can into this. And she did it. It's been two years, and here she is. She is doing everything she used to do. So if you don't get inspired by this crazy guy standing here, be inspired by her. Because she's the one that got me here, she's the one that built me back up, even while I was supposed to be supporting her. So if, if, if you have that much strength in you, if you have this feeling of you can go further, I guarantee each and every one of you that you can. Go out there, solve problems, and be the best developer you can be. Thank you very much.